Hello everyone, this is Ron Bush with Ron Bush Consulting and welcome to the Information Playground. Uh, if you're catching us on a Monday morning at 8 a.m. or a Friday afternoon at 1 p.m., you're probably listening to WVLP. WVLP is a, is a, is a great little community station in Valparaiso, Indiana. I encourage you to either listen to us at 103.1 or even better, stream us from the website. WVLP.org will get you into their website and you can see all the great stuff they're doing in the community and, and you'll find out how you can be a part of that. If, uh, if you want to re-listen to us or catch us at a different time, you can do that on podcast, any of the podcast platforms, uh, The Information Playground or watch us on YouTube on The Information Playground. If, uh, if you like any of the uh, on-demand opportunities, uh, please uh, subscribe. Uh, that would be great. And, uh, and also, while we're talking, I'm Ron Bush, Ron Bush Consulting. We're an information security company. We help co other companies secure themselves, nonprofit organizations, uh, uh, smaller governments. I don't deal with the feds, but, but state and local. Uh, we work with some of those. Um, let us know if we can be a service to you. And if, if you're interested in the subject and want to go more in depth, check out my book on Amazon, uh, Staying Safe in a Very Dangerous World, and uh, Think Before You Click. So my website is ronbushconsulting.com. If you have questions, uh, email me at ron at ronbushconsulting.com. Questions for programming or wanting to underwrite the program on WVLP, uh, shoot off an email to Greg Kovich. He's a great guy. Info at WVLP.org. Now, I've got a good friend and a, and a regular on the program, uh, Matthew Cloud. Hey, Matthew. Hi, Ron. He's, uh, he's working from home and, uh, and meeting us in his car. You can see the traffic going by. He's not driving, so no concerns. Um, tell folks who you are and what you do. So thanks, Ron. Uh, I appreciate you having me on again. Uh, so my role at Ivy Tech is department chair for the School of Information Technology. One of those programs is cybersecurity out of the nine programs that we have. And recently added to my plate actually is our criminal justice and homeland security programs because we've been working on how we merge those together with cybersecurity, which is a lot. I think what we're going to kind of talk about today is how, how we're doing that and make that work and how do we meet those industry and local law enforcement needs. That's great. Well, I'm, I know you didn't have enough to keep you busy, so I'm glad they added more on your plate. Uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> so I know it's the end of the semester. It's been a really busy time. The end of the semester um, for all universities, all students, all educational institutions has just been scramble time, I know, because of COVID-19. Most of them go into online classes that were not online classes at the beginning of the semester. And so... Uh, Tell us a little bit about that. I know that you've, uh, you, you've gone for uh, or you've submitted paperwork on a grant. There's just all kinds of things happening in this area. Tell us a little bit about that. Sure. So I've been working on making classes virtual since I was an undergrad over 30 years ago. Just so I didn't have to spend three hours sitting in my car trying to find a parking spot. <laughs> yeah, here I am sitting in my car, <laughs> yeah. trying to find trying to find a spot that's quiet, right? Everything so, old is new again, good. right? <laughs> yes, yes. But at least now I can do something other than just say, sit and wait and watch for cars to go by, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we can have this good conversation. So, like in my own home, where we've been teaching, most of my classes have been virtual for for many years. Um, but with so many in one spot, we're a family of eight, six teenagers, two of them in college. You know, there's a lack of space in our own home to be able to have a private conversation without a million different things going on. Right. And um, so it was either this or meeting under the stairs. So there we go. <laughs> <laughs> and this at least has, you know, I've got heated seats. It's not so bad, really. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah. with Poor online Potter, he got, I'm sorry. You go ahead. I was just going to say Harry Potter got stuck under the stairs, too. It worked out for him, though, so it's okay. Yeah, and we like Harry Potter. We actually had a course that was called uh, Defense Against the Dark Art, so, you know, when that first came out, uh -huh. uh, talking about our, our first entry into cybersecurity, so that's, that's a good 
good kind of a point with that anyways. Um, and so where we're leading now, though, is I'm taking a little bit twist on an older movie with um, I have instructor training going on some basic Python. Right now, it's over 90 instructors in three sessions uh, in Cal based out of California and Texas. Normally, I would be getting ready to go hang out on the beach in California in the evenings while I'm teaching those during the day. Um, but, you know, the nice thing is I get to spend more time with my family. So th there's, there's some nice things about that. Um, our students in our IT programs are, are, for the most part, in good shape for what they need to be able to do their courses. There is some struggle, though, that a lot of our students, particularly in Lake County, not having even internet access. Right. Um, that was an issue beforehand, not just for IT. So a good thing out of this, this COVID crisis is um, funding that's being pushed through in the latest bills, like what went through on Friday, uh, there's at least supposed to be out of that three trillion dollar bill, some fifteen point seven billion dollars that's supposed to help with people getting the access they need and the education that they need. Great. Um, one of those things that we're doing that was even from before then is a national security agency grant we're applying for right now with Purdue Northwest. Maybe one day I'll be able to do, but. <laughs> Um, we're trying to work with the NSA in a, a collaborative way across different parts of the U.S. Uh, Texas A&M may be a part of that as well, uh, or we may be a part of theirs. It depends upon how all that, that plays out when the grants are all awarded. But the, um, the idea is there's so much new technology out there. How do we get that into the hands of the people that need it? Yeah. So that they can help because Ron, you can only be in so many places at once, <laughs> right? We right. we get you to fly back here every you know few months to come visit us in in Northwest Indiana, but we need more people that can do it. And like you mentioned, you know that I I don't need more stuff to do, but yet there's not someone else to do it. <laughs> <laughs> so we're growing that through education and short-term certificate programs is the idea. Instead of right now, our cybersecurity certificate programs are 27 credit hours. That's still half of an associate's degree, you know, roughly. So how do we make that work with um, how do we make that work with the um, uh, those that need to get something in three to four months? So we're looking at 18 credit hour, uh, very short term uh, cert, cert, uh, certificate programs, uh -huh. which have up to six certifications in them. Wow. That's so great. they could start with an A plus. Maybe they don't need the A plus if they've got that, but at least it's there if they have some sort of baseline knowledge. And go to CCNA Cyber Ops, uh, which is the new Cisco. Uh, they actually call it Cisco Cyber Operations Associate now. Uh, a bit of a branding change on it, and that's to actively defend an attack. There's uh, some security, a variety of different security courses out there, and certifications on ethical hacking and forensics. But there needs to be more depth in that. The labs in those are, are difficult. And Ron, you could, you know, I'm sure talk about how do you work with those tools. And I don't know, how do, you, how do you do that, you know, when you test things out yourself? How do you test out uh, new tools in a safe sandboxed area? How would you do that as a professional these days? Well, it's a real struggle. I have a, a computer that I reserve for that. I don't, I don't connect it into the, to uh, any of my internet connections here. And so I, I actually really struggle with that every time. It's 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 hard to it's hard to keep it separate. You don't want anything getting loose in your own environment. Um, you know, right. I get hacked, my credibility kind of flies out the window. So <laughs> it's even worse if I right. hack myself. So uh, yeah, and, and banks struggle with that. How do you um, you want to make sure that you're secure, but you also want to make sure nobody knows that you might have a hole somewhere yeah so how do you make all that work in a safe environment so one of the things that we've been working on is a couple of different packages that are cyberbit with a company out of israel which is a fairly expensive package of about six million dollars um to do and they they have smaller versions but still it's an expensive road to go and that's what purdue west lafayette did uh with their department of labor grant here recently that they received on cybersecurity. Um, we have been looking at a different option uh, because of that cost, because that doesn't scale. Um, it's a great tool, I, I love it, but 
but it doesn't scale uh, past when the grant is done. We need something that's sustainable. You know, after a year or two or three, even if we have with a grant, what happens after that year or three? Right. We're going to create another $6 million budget out of somewhere? Probably not. Right. Um, so uh, there is a master student out of Syracuse who's created an open source system on GitHub for a cyber range, and my students have been working with that as well as Professor Saleh and, and Ben Marrero out of Valparaiso. They have, um, their students with our students have been creating this open source platform uh, on Amazon. So AWS, um, Great. looks like it's costing us about a dollar a day to run, but Amazon is granting us that access and we can create more VMs to make that work. That's, that's where we're at now. What we have been doing is a system called NetLab, which is also a great system. We spent $750,000 on it. And five years ago, the labs that were created for cybersecurity were great. But those were developed by a grant by another institution out of Texas and Illinois and some other places. That, a great, great set of tools, but it hasn't been updated. Right? There's not been a funding mechanism to keep that moving. So that's one of the things we're looking out of this NSA grant is, how can we make sure that we're writing these labs in a way and put in an environment that are easy enough for people to maintain? At the same time, a system that's powerful enough to allow us to teach it to 20 to 30 students at a time. Right, that's excellent. And by the way, I, I didn't give you a complete answer on the tricky stuff, I don't do it. Um, I hire that, I hire that out to other people. So like pen testing and things like that, I don't do that. There's just, there's only so much any of us can keep up with in this world. And, and that changes right. all the time. Um, I mean, if anything, it's cliches to say it changes daily. I mean, that stuff probably changes hourly if we were going to compare it. It's just, uh, it's just incredible to keep up with. And most of the stuff, you know, out in the wild where you're looking at zero day, where you're trying to stay on top of this stuff, it is. Tell me again the name of that first one, not NetLab, but the one that uh, Professor Marrero and Salea uh, that they worked on. It's on AWS. What's so there's name? an open source. It's, it's called Cyber Range. If you were to Google Cyber Range and, 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 and uh, GitHub, um, that's the name of the project on, on there that this uh, graduate student out of Syracuse did. And um, our students have been working to replicate. So when you think about research at an academic institution, something that at least should be done well and has been done well in the past is someone has an idea, they get it out there, they go out and they test it and it works. Well, that's great, but other people need to be able to replicate that work. Right. Right. And that way we can have assurance that it's correct. Right. So, so I so, spoke about last time. So you guys were just getting into it. And in fact, I was uh, privileged to be on a call, I don't know, two, three weeks ago with you. Um, and gosh, it looks exciting. Yes. You want to talk a little bit more about that, a little deeper on CyberRange? Yeah, because it, it, we got into it originally trying to find a way to do competitions more effectively. So there's, there's a number of different competitions, National Cyber League and, and others that uh, are looking for places to host cyber competitions. And we can do that through our NetLab system. Those servers have 768 gigs of RAM um, on each one. And it allows us to, to scale up to having you know, 256 users at one time, potentially, on the same system. Um, and each one having between 16 and, and 64 gigabytes of RAM. And if you're not into RAM and what that means, it's a lot for today, maybe not in a year. <laughs> but for today, that's, that's a lot. Um, and that's what you need to do to be able to run a virtual system. Instead of having a computer with Linux, another computer with Windows 10, and another one with Windows 7, and another with Windows 8, you just have a virtual machine and you spin it up on your computer in seconds. Right? And in between, you know, beforehand, back in the 90s, we would do dual boot, even in the early 2000s. You could... Uh, start up your computer and it would start into a Linux or a Unix operating system, or it could start into Windows or Windows 3.1 <laughs> or Windows 95, right? Mm -hmm. So you might have different operating systems. And even then, the the um, 
the file storage system might be 16 or 32 or now 64 bit. It was 64 bit for a long time, right? Um, so when you use a VM, you get rid of all those variations in your hardware system and it's emulated, right? It could be bare, bare metal, which we are using with um, the NetLab system using uh, VMware with vSphere and vCenter. Um, but we also use Oracle VirtualBox for many classes. And then you have AMIs that kind of have that same kind of effect with Amazon so that we're able to uh, create these machines up in there and pull them up as needed on the fly. And then you can get, like I discussed the last time, about containers. Maybe you don't need a full operating system. You just need a part of that. Just one container to do just one part of it, not the full OS. So you can do that with containers. And you can even go to a further extent and that's called Lambda functions. So you're not even really running a part of that system anymore. You're just running that, that function when you need to. So all that is enabled through these shared services, cloud services, that kind of stuff. Yet someone at some point still has to create that virtual machine, still has to create an image of what you want to work with or even that container. And there has to be a way to make that work easily to put it up there for people to update over time. So if I spent all this effort, several years, creating the perfect system for what I need now, that's great. But somebody needs to be able to update that later. Right. And that's where we've been stuck for many years is being able to update that. Because there's, at our college, there's two of us that can do it. Out of the hundreds of IT faculty, there's two of us. <laughs> and I haven't figured out how to do cloning yet to that extent. <laughs> So uh, these VMs will, will, get, will help get us there. Um, the other part, like you mentioned, there's so much happening, changing all the time, right? So how do you keep pace with that? There's so many devices being brought on the network, all these IoT endpoint devices, um, cell phones, which do things like I can do this interview with you right now in my car, but it could be a security risk at, a, at another place, right? So how do you quarantine those devices and know what's happening? That's where we get into machine learning. And machine learning has been you know, this, this topic that's hard for people to understand um, because you needed uh, a degree in statistics <laughs> or someone that's an expert in statistics, right? And then you need an industry expert for that given area. Then you need an expert in programming to tie them together. And then maybe somebody else too, right? So it's so, so difficult to make that work. And that's, that's the most accessible part, actually, of uh, artificial intelligence. However, you can go to code.org now, and we do Hour of Code with students to get them excited, to have some fun. Uh -huh. And I did code.org, uh, I guess it was last week, with 21st century charter school students to show them about what we're doing in, in IT. And there's a module in there on AI. And a very simple area of machine learning is classification. And as you're going through trash in the sea, this is the exercise, right? You want to get rid of trash in the sea. Say, so, oh, this is a fish, this is not a fish. It's just simple binary, yes or no. Fish, not a fish, right? right. And then you can expand that as they go. And I wasn't sure if the students really were getting into it, but they loved it. And that was through virtual. I can't see them. At least I can see you and your reaction on, on what we're doing here. Uh -huh. But um, in a virtual environment, that can be very difficult to do. So there's, there's tools that are coming out there, yet there's still this need to make it easier when you get to, uh, okay, great, I can show somebody something interesting, but how do I make that work in a, in, a, in a practical way? And how can we use that for businesses that want to make sure that their network, their computer systems, their software is secure? Right. And so that's going back and forth between like the cloud and what we've talked before about edge based systems versus on premise. Right. And how do we merge those together? And so they're coming really close to working. And I think I totally went off from the question you originally had was like, how does the cyber range itself work? <laughs> well, you did, but you, you entered an area that I'm, I'm fascinated with. Um, I, I had a, a gentleman on, uh, on the program. Oh, a month or two ago, Alexander Fleiss. He has a company, Rebellion, Rebellion uh, something, can't remember the name, maybe I've got it here, Rebellion Research. So um, he, Rebellion Research, he uses, uh, he uses machine learning to find 
uh, go through all the news and find things that are a, of a concern. So I get a daily email from him. But the right. reason he's into the business at all is because he, he got started years ago in, oh, it was one of the Ivy League, school, Ivy League schools, Harvard, Princeton, one of the, Yale, somewhere over there. Um, he got into those, got into coding, and came up with a, uh, an exchange traded fund, an ETF, that used machine learning to know where to invest. And I, while I've forgotten the name of his fund, um, I remember him telling me that, that it didn't, it has never lost money, even during the, uh, the recession in 2008. So, uh, which, I mean, again, I'm not an investor. This is not a, uh, a sales uh, promotion or anything else. Um, but uh, I thought that was pretty, pretty. Uh, so the, the, the general premise behind machine learning is you're not actually coding. Mm -hmm. you're, you're using data to write the code for you, if you will. Right. And so you have this prior behavioral analysis. We know the stock market is going to do this in these given situations. So the better you can train that data, just like if I were talking about this is a fish, this is not a fish. Mm. Well, that's great. Well, maybe you, you threw something out of the ocean and it's an octopus. Okay. <laughs> And that really should stay in, right? So the better you train that data, the more you can classify it, the better it starts to learn and understand, right? So it can understand and adapt that situation. So if it's a yellow fish or a blue fish or a red fish, and I'm not going to do Dr. Seuss, but, <laughs> <laughs> but the, um, the idea is that it learns like we learn through repetitive success and failure. So now right. you're getting into deep learning, deep learning, right? Well, yes, deep learning is an aspect of that as well. Neural networks and how that goes, that gets, well, deep, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> but um, like the, the class that I'm doing for instructors, we, we touch on those subjects because there's, there is some statistics that you need to know, but you don't need to be a statistician. Right. The more you know about it, the better your data is going to be. So if I were to go out there and I don't really know anything about, uh, you know, what's happening in, in the market. And I just look at the data and say, well, it goes up here and it goes down here. So that must mean things are better on that day. And it was because the temperature outside was 70 degrees. Right. Okay. All right. I, I'm just adding in some sort of classification. that doesn't really make sense whatsoever. Maybe it does. I don't know. Maybe it has something to do with the temperature, but I don't know. I'm not that kind of an expert. That's my point. Uh -huh. is that I could be feeding it and training it all sorts of bad information, all right? So if we give it bad information, we're not going to get good results. So that means your friend has trained that tool mm -hmm. to know what to look for because he probably has a good eye for looking at certain things. So I can look at – I could probably look at certain industries and do that and, and match it up, and that's how I've done well on the market, right? Mm -hmm. But when you're using machine learning, the idea is to look at the past to try to predict the future, but not just to be able to predict the future, but so you can shape how the future works. Right. Yeah, his point that's was, a concept. Go ahead. I, I was just going to say that that's exactly what he said. Here you, you, uh, you touch on a couple of things. One is uh, um, discrimination. There's been a lot in the news about all the algorithms that, that just are, they're written by, by, people in different uh, areas that are somewhat discriminatory against other folks because it just simply doesn't take them into account. So writing well, an algorithm from that res respect that discriminates. Now, you, in the press, they're talking about racial or they're talking about socioeconomic or, or gender, but, but that would hold true through anything. Back to, to the, the news, if, if you don't take into account the relationship between uh, North Korea and Russia or North Korea and China in in trying to determine how the daily news affects whatever it is, the market or anything else. If you leave that out, you've discriminated against that. And now your 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 consensus isn't worth the time it took to get it because you've left something important out. So there are discrimination gets used in two different ways and get commingled in this particular topic, unfortunately in a way that people hear something without realizing the context. Right. So 
unfortunately, people use the word discrimination when they're really referring to bias. Yes. Right. Yeah. And discrimination in machine learning is about is something that is needed, not as in the sense from a social aspect, but is, is it a, a fish or not a fish, mm -hmm. right? You are doing discrimination there. That's what you're supposed to be doing in this particular case. However, there is going to be a bias, right? Maybe I think uh, uh, a whale is a fish. I know it's not. I know it's a mammal, right? But maybe that's what I think. Mm -hmm. And that's my bias from what I have known, what I've been taught, right? So my ability to discriminate properly is impacted because of that. Just like these machine learning tools could be. If someone doesn't, you know, they grew up and all they know are, are, are white males, that would be a very sad life. But, <laughs> <laughs> but um, they don't know how to interact or understand the bias of another group right and it was something that you know we're tying it back into what's happening now with covid i went and got tested on wednesday uh, for covid 19 because they've expanded in indiana for testing for those who are asymptomatic no symptoms right never had any symptoms but fall into a high risk group which i do not only that i work with people who came back from wuhan that lit <laughs> their families from there they were there during the peak of all that and I was interacting with them in you know, mid-January before any of us really knew what was going on. He knew and he told me, and I was like, what are you talking about, right? Yeah. Yeah. So we started looking into it and um, uh, the, um, and then you know, I was traveling in those few weeks from one side of the coast to the other, meeting with large groups of people in the middle of DC and San Jose on the other side. So was it likely that I came in their interaction with somebody? Probably pretty likely. Yeah. Um, and so I'm not going to say I did get my results back in three days, but it doesn't matter because I'm asymptomatic. Does a positive test mean something? Well, it mean, means that I, I came in contact with somebody, but it doesn't mean that I have the disease if yeah. I tested positive, nor does it mean that I won't get it. Right. But it, we, we don't know. Right. And if I test negative, does that mean that I never was in contact with it? Or is it just that the, um, the loading of that virus is so low it wasn't able to be detected because we get a false positive or a possible po false negative as well. And they don't know the specificity of the test yet. That's right. So specificity is, um, you know, how reliable is that test for a given clinical situation? And our governor's office has funded uh, a group um, out of Indi Indianapolis uh, I believe with IUPUI, I know it's at least with IU there in Indianapolis, um, but they are starting to publish some re results of their first round of 5,000, testing 5,000 people here in, in the state. And so I, I've been talking about this again from the machine learning, because I've been doing this kind of analysis for a long time on radiological health engineering, biomedical engineering about applying these types of statistical techniques. Mm -hmm. uh, we had to learn how to do it for viral trends and that kind of stuff. And I focus more on brain energy, right? So when they started talking about the results, they don't have any sort of variance or, or error analysis that they're doing with it. Yeah. And that causes me concern about how some of this testing is being done and being put out there because of politics. Yeah. Um, that whether that's really going to help us to understand what's happening or not. So we need a lot of people to go out there and get tested. <laughs> yeah. It, as that becomes available so we can figure that out. But go ahead. I, well, I think that's the most frustrating thing about watching the news. The only number that means anything when they give the stats on COVID-19 are the deaths. And that's the only thing you can hang your hat on. It's well, so that, that the, the ICU beds, right? How many available ICU beds are there? Well, yeah, but you don't know how many people have it. You don't know how many people have been tested for it. You don't know how pe how many people have recovered from it. You don't know how you don't know where anybody is on that time loan, timeline. So, right. so the number of beds, I mean, that can be if there's a surplus, that's great. Unless there's a wave coming at you of people who have who have come in contact with it and they're just starting to come down with it, or 
you know, it, it, it gets into regional stuff. It gets into local with nursing homes. I mean, my goodness, the, the scope of this is so huge and the few statistics we really have to hang our hat on are so few. It, it's just frustrating. Right. And, and the models that are out there are based upon the data that they have. But again, they have bias. Yeah. Um, and even those that try to remove all sorts of bias, you can't, right? Yeah. Because without having some sort of bias to discriminate properly as to what's happening, you don't know if the results you're getting make any sense at all, right? right? So they have to make sense for the given population, uh, for the given situ situation as well, not just for the population. Um, and so if we're testing 5,000 people out of 6.7 million in the state, are we really getting a representative sample? No. Maybe it's distributed, but that doesn't necessarily, I don't want to get too far into the statistics, but it doesn't, it doesn't wash with me as far as the power of, of what they're doing no. with that small of a sample. So I'm hoping more people will get tested. We can figure out what's really happening so we can actually train some good data and uh, figure out what we're doing there. Yeah. And so that, that's one aspect. I mean, that, that's a real, you know, live virus, but the same thing works in cybersecurity. Yeah. Thanks for bringing us back. So. Go ahead and, <laughs> and, uh, and move forward with that one. What do you guys do, by the way? How do you, in class, I mean, when you're teaching, how do you sandbox stuff? What do you, uh, how do you do things? So we have a couple different tools that we use. I, I really like our NetLab system, but like I mentioned, it's difficult to keep maintain. So it can be several years old. A lot of the techniques have not really changed. And I'll, I'll get to that as well. There's a whole, that's why we're getting more into machine learning. So let me forget about that. Okay. The, um, the, um, but you know, if you want to learn how to use Wireshark, you want to know how to do some tracing, you want to know how to do, do um, uh, protocol analysis at a, at a, with other tools. Right? There's lots of ways to go about and do it. Uh, I'm kind of an old school using notepad and, and command line for everything, right? And then if I'm doing something enough, then I'll write a little script or a little program to automate it for me. Because things change so much, you have to adapt. And that's why it's been so much of a need for people to, to be involved to do that. So to keep it secure at the college, we use these virtual machines, and as long as you don't open up the ports of the virtual machine to be able to interact with the internet, which you can, but we secure it so that it cannot, um, then it keeps it localized, not even just to that machine, but also to that virtual machine. Good. So we're out in NetLab, I can go in and I can look at it and I can work with it, but it doesn't have external internet access. It goes to some fake internet sites that we have in there. And that's kind of like the same thing with a cyber range. We need to have computers that are set up in cyber range that allow us to have, you know, your, your general, you know, I'll come back to a bank again. You've got all of your, your, your tellers set up with their access for their computers, your manager with his access, people selling you loans in another part, right? <laughs> and then, you have people bringing in their own access devices in, right? Your ATM sitting out there out on its lonesome and its steel case, right? All that stuff has a computer that is interacting in some way. Great. We want to model that in a classroom environment or a competition environment. And then you have different teams. You've got your red team and your blue team. And they need to have a way to have access to that, that system. You don't want them to use external tools. You want to give them the tools within that environment. And over time, we might be able to have a way to, to expand that. But So you have your red team and your blue team. So hold that right. thought. We're going to take a quick yep. identification and come back to red and blue. Uh, normally, one's the aggressor and one's the uh, the victim, I guess you might say. Uh, so we're going to come back to that. I've got to do a quick identification. Uh, just to remind folks who they're listening to, uh, WVLP is a radio station that, uh, that we're uh, broadcast over on Monday mornings from 8 to 9, uh, Friday afternoons from 1 to 2. Uh, you're... I think you'd be, it'd be great if you streamed us from WVLP.org. If you're local, that'll give you an opportunity to get involved in the community and, and help WVLP out. They're always looking for underwriters. Uh, I underwrite my program, but you're certainly welcome to join me in that or, or uh, underwrite the program with or for me. Um, they're just a great radio station. 
You can also find us on podcast or YouTube under the Information Playground. And you can email me, Ron Bush. Email me at ron at ronbushconsulting.com. With that, we're, uh, we're having a great conversation with Matthew Cloud, who's with Ivy Tech and is all over the place. I don't know how he manages to sleep or uh, do anything else. Uh, because he just is involved in so many things and wearing so many hats. So we're talking about cybersecurity. Matthew, if folks have questions, want to follow up, you're doing so much in education. Uh, if they want to know how they can be a part of it or anything that we're talking about today, what's the best way for them to reach you? So um, for those that still use a traditional telephone, there is uh, 219-981-1111. And my extension is 5369, that's 5369. Uh, again, it's 219-981-1111. Uh, put you in touch with me through our campus, and that will dial over to my cell phone in this virtual environment. Mm -hmm. You can also reach me through mcloud3, m as in Matthew, cloud like a cloud in the sky, the number three at ivytech.edu, or visit us at ivytech.edu slash IT for our IT programs. So typically, back to, to where I cut you off, typically blue team is, is the, uh, the organization on defense. Red team is typically the aggressor representing the hacker. Uh, these are, uh, uh, I don't know if you want to call it battles, competition sometimes, but it's also in larger companies that can afford this, it's actually how they learn to protect themselves. So, right. so go ahead. So uh, on the blue team, uh, you have your defenders, which right, the blue team is not necessarily the tellers, though in an ideal situation, they would be a part of that team, right? So when we're looking at a competition environment, you don't usually have someone acting the part of a teller, but they're the people that are making sure that your resources are properly defended. And it could be a manager, it could be a cybersecurity professional, um, but there are many different parts of your team. Those are things that the institutions should really think about and you know work with individuals like yourself um, to make sure that they're actively looking for threats on their system and making sure things are properly shut down. Right. Um, and so that's what the blue team is is there basically doing. And usually, to more of a cybersecurity extent um, on the active side, where the red team. Um, is out there trying to fish for things, coming back to red fish, blue fish, right? So the red team is out there um, trying to find holes in that system and break in, right? They're gonna take whatever that function, or maybe they wanna get malware in place, or that malware is a way for them to get that information, or whether they're doing phishing, or whatever it is that they're trying to do, uh, they may use a variety of tools uh, to get in uh, to that, uh, place and that and that's what they're doing there and then you might also have another group that's actually monitoring the situation again this is a uh, a situation where there it could be a competition so you have another group monitoring that activity between the aggressor and the defender which we do we've got the NSA and other groups out there doing that already mm -hmm. right trying to help intervene where needed um, and so all of that takes some considerable resources to do, uh, and it's and when it works well, it's a lot of fun. Yes. Right. So, and and what has worked well um, is doing it on site. People can bring laptops in. It reminds me of back in the '90s when I was in college, and uh, we'd bring our computer, our desktop computers, so it was huge computers on our shoulder, and and network them locally so we could play our games with each other. <laughs> and. Uh, eventually people could afford, you know, bringing in laptops, but now it's all, how do we do that cloud-based? Well, you can do games that way. People play Fortnite and all this other stuff that use a tremendous amount of resources right. uh, to do some pretty fantastic things out there. Yet we haven't as a nation spent that kind of effort for securing the environment, right? How do we make sure that we're keeping safe? Even if it's for you to play those games, um, so that's what we're really hoping to get out of the, the open source cyber range work that we're doing is making that, um, taking the work that they've been doing out of Syracuse and other groups, working collaborative. That's a beautiful thing about GitHub. GitHub is a 
a great open source environment uh, for people to share work together. And we teach that with our students starting in their very first classes in programming and some of our other classes where they can then share the work that they do, understand how it works. But when they get to their, their 200 level, their sophomore level classes, those projects that they're developing, they're able to share out there and get up for others to use and also use as a tool to help get them employment. You want to know what they can do? It's right there. That's excellent. And I, I'm, I'm with you wholeheartedly. We've talked about this, I don't know how many times, uh, in, just privately and, and on, the, on air as well. Um, this has got to become more of a partnership between business, education, and government. Uh, we, we just reached the point where, I mean, I don't, I don't know that, that we've tipped over, but honestly, the, the amount of cyber crime that is pointed against us, Americans, is just unbelievable. But it, around the world, I mean, countries right and left that can't afford it, the Ukraine. Ukraine is a hotbed for cyber, crim, cyber criminals, but it's also... Sure. Uh, you know, it, it's also activity against the Ukrainians. Uh, Russia right. often constantly attacks them. And it isn't just nation states, it's individuals, it's lone wolves, it's, uh, it's anarchists, yeah. it's, uh, it's, it's script kiddies. I mean, it's everybody's in the act. And, and if, Very we, true. if we don't start doing something, much like what you're, you're doing right now at Ivy Tech and attempting to grow, uh, we've got to, we just got to, otherwise it's going to be too late one of these days. And, uh, you know, I hate to think about that. Well, that's why I'm glad that the work that we're doing um, with four-year colleges, like with Hawaii and uh, Purdue, and possibly with Texas A&M, um, to expand and share our knowledge across these institutions. I, it was really kind of a neat thing. Uh, Professor Sal Salalea was already working with the chief security officer for the Hawaii systems on uh, a better way to do the National Cyber League competition. They were having those conversations. We said, you know what, we need to have a third, at least a third um, a college working with us on this National Cyber Security Agency grant. Mm -hmm. And over the past couple of weeks, we've started talking about what they're doing, what we're doing. Um, well, we're the only statewide community college system in the, in the nation that does anything like what we do, singly accredited. So we all use the same curriculum at all 18 of our campuses. Mm -hmm. Hawaii has a system, and it's common to have systems in different states, but Hawaii is a smaller state. Um, their universities and colleges work together hand in hand. The applied sciences, even the bachelor in applied science, is done through the community college, while the more theoretical is done through the university. And so the conversations we were having here this past week on Back on Friday was, you know, they've got these new theories that they're doing. They've got workshops on quantum computing to be used in cybersecurity. How do we get that in the hands of people at the applied level? Now, that one, you know, is still a little tough yet to do today, but in a year, maybe two, well, because we're planning this out over the next year for implementation. We start actually delivering it in a year. And that's the other part of it is everything's changing so fast. But in the education system, it takes us a year or two to get the funding and to get through all the legal paperwork to get something out there. We've got a cloud technologies degree we've talked about for years, and we finally come to a way that we think we can agree to across the state. But it's going to be two years before it actually gets full funding from the Department of Education for that level of, of approval. See, somehow that's, that's got to change. There really isn't a good excuse for that. You're just to prove your point, and we've talked about uh, edge computing before, and we've talked about 5G before. I see no reason not to marry the two. You've got to have close close proximity for both, and I right. I, I, I just seems like a, a no brainer if we're going to cover the country. So, uh, I, I forgive me, folks that are listening, if you're not in uh, up on your 5G and and uh, uh, edge computing, I, I don't blame you. It's fairly new. So uh, you wanna, you're going to express this probably better than I, I can. Talk uh, just enough to, uh, to bring people with an understanding how the two work, why they need to be in close proximity, and how they could marry the two. Now, 
I don't know if you've thought about that before because we haven't discussed it, but it just seems like a no-brainer. You, uh, I'm going back to what I already said. So which which two do you want me to tie together? The edge stuff that we're talking about here, or what? <laughs> edge and 5G. So edge. Okay. To sure. get it started, edge is is a uh, like a local cloud, if you will. It's a it's a uh, it's a data center that uh, is not going to be a million square feet that covers up you know the northeastern. Uh, part of the country, it's going to be a local um, uh, cloud, and you might have uh, maybe four or five of them in Chicago. Maybe you have more than that. Maybe you'll have a dozen of them. Um, right, right. So, like here in, in South Bend, where I'm at at the moment, uh, the former mayor Pete Buttigieg worked with Amazon to put edge data centers in the former Studebaker factories. Right, so these are buildings sitting vacant. Uh, low cost real estate, but it's on a major pathway for the internet. So it's got high internet access availability. So um, what that allows us to do is if you've got, you know, it's kind of like buying versus renting a car in a way, right? So if you have a car and you're going to keep changing that car out every year or every six months and you don't really know what you want, you probably should lease. Because buying that's going to get expensive. Every time you buy it, you lose money after, you know, you take it off the lot kind of a thing. Right. Right. Now, in IT, you don't necessarily lose money when you buy it. You could sell it back pretty quick to that. But in six months, the, the cost of that has gone down considerably. So when you move from, and some people might have forgotten this as everything's moved so much cloud-based, is the idea of moving to the cloud was so that you could reduce those costs locally, right? Right, and we've we've had a swing of oh, let's just put everything on the cloud, right? So, in fact, I was talking to my father today, who works for the city of Fort Worth, and he used to work for the Navy on some major projects, and he gets into some large data files on the buildings and those kind of things, um, and they moved to OneDrive recently, as did we at Ivy Tech. We moved to OneDrive. Get everything off your desktop, everything off your computer, and move it to OneDrive. Okay, OneDrive is cloud-based. Nothing wrong with OneDrive. I'm not talking bad about it at all. But you don't want to put large files on there. Because yeah. you don't need to synchronize a three gigabyte file. That's not a smart use of, of cloud stuff unless you're going to use it on the cloud. Because for data storage, you're moving stuff out there and you want to bring it back when you need it. Right. That's a lot of bandwidth just getting used for transferring data. You got small files like, oh, here's a little thought, a little document. It's gone, split second. That's good, right? But those large systems, that large data that you want to keep, you want it really closer to you, right? But maybe you don't need it on site. Maybe you just need it nearby and you want it to be more cost effective. You know you're going to need a ton of storage. Well, you might go and buy a, uh, a one terabyte backup drive and you put it there locally. You might buy a few of them, two or three or four or five, right? And that's how people deal with it locally. Not everybody does backup drives locally, but if you're working with large data, you're probably used to doing it that way. Otherwise it just doesn't make sense. Right. right. And um, it just tears everything. I think in fact, the last time that we had our conversation, we tried to do our video, my, my video was so choppy because we had just switched over to OneDrive with everything and everything on my computer started synchronizing. And I had no control over that aspect of it other than shutting the computer down. Right. <laughs> and so um, those things have to be watched well. So if you think about that, that, um, that local drive that you have for your computer and you take it off when you need it, put it back on when you need, that's kind of like how Edge works but for a company, right? So if you have a company that needs a large amount of systems, maybe not data storage, but processing power, like these cyber ranges, then we can off site them somewhere and work with them wherever it's the lowest cost real estate. Excellent, excellent. There's certain, I, I assume, well, let's not go down, that just muddies the water more. So, so we, we're, we're talking about edge 5G, what's your thought, thought there? Okay. Oh, and, and, and 5G is another part of that. It, just having higher, faster internet access is great, but again, it's also about managing that, that properly. 
Right. If you're trying to, to drive a, a jumbo jet down the highway, that's not going to work so well, right? So that's why we use, you know, the, the, the physical Wi-Fi of flying through the air, right? So those, it has to do with, with managing that properly, but 5G allows us to do larger sets of information, yet we still can't, even with that, do big data. Right. So that there's a little bit of a catch there, and I guess that's where in cloud and the rest of that video streaming, live streaming of stuff, right? Yeah. The stuff is changing like you and I right now. Yeah. So um, go ahead. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interrupt you for a second. We've got 10 minutes, a little less than 10 minutes. So okay. um, I'll finish up, if I may, the point I, I wanted us to make on the on the 5G. The 5G is uh, is to use your example of, of putting a, a, a large amount of data in the cloud and then working with it in the cloud, that's the, one of the big proponents of 5G. When you talk about driverless cars, when you talk about flying cars, I mean, all those algorithms, all that data has to work back and forth. It works if it's fast enough. Otherwise, right. your, your, your vehicle loses uh, connection it, it, it can't you know it can't drive smoothly because it, right. it can't process fast enough I mean a whole lot exactly. of things have to work together for this to work uh, correctly but um, so that's the idea and if you're using local edge uh, data centers uh, as let's say a driverless car or a flying car goes through now you've got an even greater speed rather than trying to, to communicate with a, a, a larger cloud um, right. Without naming names, I, I don't know how else to explain it, and I hope that's as clear clearer than mud. Sure. And I had a client of mine back in 2002. I wrote a mobile device version of, of buying home. I'm not going to name the, the company, uh -huh. but uh, you could buy a house in 10 minutes with this application that worked on a mobile device. Uh, now people didn't have smartphones then. This was a compact handheld that would connect to a cell phone if it had local internet uh, through their, their mobile device. But most people didn't, right? It needed to c keep enough information to be able to do that processing locally. And then as soon as they had internet access, even if that meant coming back to their, their uh, office, that's where most of their storage of what they needed was there. Mm -hmm. Yet everything they had there then needed to go back to the corporate headquarters which not only had the corporate information, but also information from all 300 franchises, right? But the other 300 franchises don't need the other 299. They only need their information, right? Right. So m mastering how you move through that is, is key. But having that access, like back then, smartphones were limited because the internet access was low. Now we've got 5G will allow us to, like, we have a little bit of glitches in what we're doing right now on these 4G networks with our conversation we're having with two-way. One-way live streaming works pretty good on 4G. Yes. It still has its limitations. People have been having problems with Netflix and those kind of things. But when you're trying to have a two-way conversation, yeah, you really need 5G. And if you're trying to have a two-way conversation with your car that's about your life, yeah, you really want at least 5G. Yeah. <laughs> All right, my friend, last thoughts. So I, I, what I really want to think about is as we're moving this forward and, you know, a year down the road, all of that allows us to get into machine learning uh, and artificial intelligence in a way that we can look at those threats without having a person to be there to do every step of the way. So as we have, you know, a thousand new devices that come the, onto the campus, it will automatically look for threats right, and quarantine that and alert that to a cybersecurity expert who can then take a stronger look at it, right, and, and use the tools that they know for that particular application rather than trying to, to do that for every device that comes in, which is just impossible to do, right? right? So that's where it takes us, and um, I'm very hopeful for where that will help us, not just in cybersecurity, but also in healthcare, right, because all those different industries, manufacturing, as Texas a and is focusing on the the manufacturing side of that with um, cybersecurity, as well as we have a Department of Labor grant on apprenticeships in um, adding cybersecurity 
and IoT security into industry 4.0, those kind of things. So we're moving in the right direction. Uh, looks like the federal government is, is, is starting to fund things in that direction to make it easier for us to, to move that. Hopefully, um, we'll be able to have our programs uh, that can adapt more quickly like we do right now. We're, we're doing that adaptation through workforce alignment. So because things can move slower, if our college accepts credit or what's called prior learning assessment for certifications, which we do, mm -hmm. um, then they could take that course in a variety of ways. And if they pass that certification, then they get college credit and can achieve uh, a faster pathway to the more theoretical side. Right. And so that's, that's what's allowed us to really bring that together. And it looks like we'll, we'll be able to help with Hawaii, which is coordinated really well with each other on the education side, but trying to make that where you can leapfrog those who can already have some sort of basis of knowledge. That's where they're trying to add it in. And they've done some areas that we haven't uh, of, of making more applied technology at the bachelor's level. Um, so th there's some shared pathways that are coming uh, across the nation. And uh, that makes me very hopeful. I hope it does you too. Yeah, it does. It does indeed. And there's a lot of good things. You know, so often in, in my field, I have to dwell on the negative because, you know, most of the news is bad. But, right. uh, but this is, a, this is, is really a positive step. And, and it's, I always enjoy our conversations, but uh, I like ending on a positive note, and that's a good place to end, plus we're out of time. So uh, <laughs> with that, um, Matthew, your uh, contact information one last time for folks? 219-981-1111, extension 5369, or mcloud3 at ivytech.edu. Excellent. I'm Ron Bush with Ron Bush Consulting. Check out my website, ronbushconsulting.com. Uh, send me an email, uh, ron at ronbushconsulting.com. But, but check out our, our podcast and our uh, YouTube channels, The Information Playground, or look for us on WVLP uh, under The Information Playground. Thanks for being with us today. And uh, Matthew, thanks for all you do and for being with us today as well. Thank you, Ron. Take care, my friends.